Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Lavinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at the NYRB uh, Poetry Series for a discussion of Richard Howard's new poetry collection, Richard Howard Loves Henry James and Other American Writers, with Tim Timothy Donnelly, Rosanna Warren, Edward Hirsch, and NYRB Poets editor Edwin Frank. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a huge thanks to Timothy and Rosanna and Edward and Edwin for joining us this evening. So to a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We will try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button right down here where I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book from our store, which is very important. Please click and buy, uh, as well as links to some other great programming we have coming up with NYRB and NYRB Classics. Uh, a caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We will try to get through them quickly. Uh, and finally, our event series will continue through the fall and into the winter. So head over to our website to find out what's coming up. Uh, two pro programs that I do want to point out. Tomorrow at 6 p.m., we're jumping right back into our MRB series to welcome acclaimed artist Celia Paul, live from London, to discuss her new memoir, Self-Portrait, in conversation with Judith Thurman. And then next Thursday, we're thrilled to welcome Daryl Pinckney to the Zoom stage for a discussion of his critical essay collection, Blackballed, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy, in conversation with Zach Graham. Uh, we're taking registrations for both of those events now, and I'll be posting links to them in the chat. So now a little about our presenters, and we will get started. Timothy Donnelly is the author of three books of poems, most recently, The Problem of the Many, which received the inaugural Big Other Book Award for Poetry and the Cloud Corporation, winner of the 2012 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. A Guggenheim Fellow, he teaches in the writing program of Columbia University School of the Arts. Rosanna Warren is a poet, essayist, translator, and biographer. Her most recent book of poetry is So Forth, and she is the Hannah Holborn Gray Distinguished Service Professor in the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Edward Hirsch is a poet, critic, and president of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fund. He is the author of 10 poetry collections, including Wild Gratitude and most recently Stranger by Night, as well as five prose books about poetry, including How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry, which is dedicated to Richard Howard, adept of the world of reading. And finally, Edwin Frank is the founder and editor of the MYRB Poets series and the author of a book of poems, Snake Train. So, Timothy, Rosanna, Edward, and Edwin, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, uh, Timothy, Edward, and Rosanna for being here. Thank, thank you all for being out there. Um, and thanks to Community Books for uh, hosting the series of readings that we've now been doing, both for NYRB Classics and NYRB Poets since, since the spring, and will continue to be doing. Um, so tonight we're here to talk about and read from, um, it's not precisely accurate to say that it's called Richard Howard, R.H. Rich, Richard Howard loves Henry James, in other, it's R.H. Hart's H.J. Uh, so it's got a kind of Kilroy was here quality um, to it. I think Kilroy was here comes up somewhere in it too. And um, this book, um, well, Richard and I started talking about it uh, probably close to five years ago, the idea, he sort of floated the idea of whether he, he wondered whether the various poems he'd written um, in, an, in and around Henry James, there's surprisingly, there's only one I think in this book finally that is actually in the voice of Henry James, um, uh, would, would make, make up a full book. And, uh, and if they did, would I be interested in, in publishing it? And I thought um, that sounded like a really, that sounded like a wonderful way of, of sort of distilling uh, some of Richard's interests in his poetry and also as a critic. Um, and we talked about it, but not much happened. And then a few years ago, I think David um, Alexander, Richard's partner, uh, Put together the poems, and it wasn't. It wasn't. They weren't. They weren't quite enough to make up a book. So, um, what to do? Because the idea still of that being a book seemed still an interesting one. Um, we then thought, well, let's add 
Walt Whitman, in a way, sort of Henry James's opposite, though um, James having written a corrosive review of, of, of Whitman's um, drum taps when James was still a young man, uh, later came to love Whitman very much. And, and um, I think there is a lot more in common between those uh, two writers than is commonly acknowledged or widely acknowledged even to this day. And I think part of Richard's wisdom and inspiration is to see that. So we added Walt Whitman and then we added, um, for good measure, we started looking at the other uh, poets, American poets that, that, uh, that Richard has uh, written, uh, has evoked in various ways. Um, and uh, that included a, a sequence about Wallace Stevens and, uh, and then a poem to Hart Crane. And we had a book. Uh, a book which goes back to, not to the beginning of Richard's um, very long career, but back to the 70s and up to the last decade. A book that includes not only Henry James and Walt Whitman, but Hugh Walpole and Edith Wharton and L. Frank Baum and characters in Henry James and complete improbabilities. And rereading it um, for this occasion, I, I you could say it's, it is one of the most, and I'm the publisher, so I would say this, but I really mean it. Uh, one of the most enjoyable public books of poetry that I, one could imagine reading, one of the most diverting books of poetry one could imagine reading. And that it reads wonderfully, not only in, not only in the variety of its individual poems, but also it, it pleased me very much to realize as a book in the sense that the question came up of how to organize the book. And you know, we could have organized it in terms of, we could have pigeonholed the poets. So here's the Henry James section, here's the Walt, Walt Whitman section. Uh, we, could have, um, we could have done it chronologically by when Richard wrote the poems, but we did it almost um, uh, without a great deal of thought, uh, put it together chronologically by when the poems are said to take place. And what happens that way is that you, you, you go through James at the beginning and then um, some Whitman poems, but at the end, the final poem, the poem to Hart Crane is written in the seventies in Richard's proper voice. So that you actually see at the end, Richard emerge from the mix of poets uh, that have, have nurtured him and to whom, uh, whose, whose legacy he is, he is, is he is now well he is part of that legacy for all of us anyway um the book also contains a wonderful introduction by timothy and uh i thought i would turn um first of all to to timothy to uh to read a poem or so we can get a sense of it and then we can start a discussion uh and and both rosanna and and ed, ed will also read uh from the book too well, thank you very much, Edwin. I'll be very happy to read a poem. Um, and uh, thank you too for the honor of being able to write this introduction and also the great uh, patience you had with me uh, with regards to, uh, that was in the to things when you were writing. and the passage of time. I think I first heard from you back in um, early, mid-January about writing this introduction. And I think I had a couple of months to do it. And then after a couple of months had passed is when lockdown started to happen and all the changes in my life that fell after that or fell in line after that complicated things considerably, but it was a huge pleasure and honor to be able to do this uh, once I uh, began undertaking the task in earnest. I'm going to read one of the shorter poems from the collection, from the selection, and it's called Now Voyager, um, a title that might be familiar to many. Uh, now Voyagers from a suite of five poems that Richard wrote called The Masters at the Movies. And uh, he included this suite of poems in his 2002 collection, Talking Cures. These poems are among what Howard has called his outrageous ventriloquisms, uh, uh, speaking through the masks of known figures, but in unlikely or even impossible imagined scenarios. Uh, others in this series, Masters at the Movies, include uh, Willa Cather on the Garbo movie, Queen Christina, and Rudyard Kipling on King Kong. <laughs> I think both Cather and, and Kipling would, they lived long enough to have seen those movies if they had wished to. But um, James uh, died a few decades before Now Voyager, the movie that 
he has things to say about uh, was released. Now Voyager, again, as many of you, many of you know, is a, a Betty Davis melodrama. Uh, and the plot of that movie has to do really at the core of it is self-invention, uh, self-liberation or self-reinvention. And it uh, concludes with an almost contractual kind of happiness uh, that wouldn't have been out of keeping with a, a story by James or a novel by James. But like others in this series, the masters at the movie uh, movies, uh, the poem does quibble a little bit with the relative simplicity of characterization that we find in cinema or most cinema or cinema of the time versus what we uh, might or what we have come to expect in a novel, certainly in a novel of um, the kind that James wrote. Uh, as we know, James, of course, is uh, regarded often as a significant precursor to the stream of consciousness, as we see just, for example, in Portrait of a Lady. Um, but uh, in, in Now Voyager, the poem I'm, ba I'm about to read, um, it, it, there, there's some quarreling with with what uh, with the uh, with the the difference between the two genres, the two artistic modes of representation, the novelistic versus the cinematic. Uh, and in this uh, in this poem, uh, Howard quotes uh, a letter from Henry James to Hugh Walpole, whom Edward mentioned uh, early in the at, 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 in his introduction. Uh, and in this letter, uh, James uh, takes issue with the with the novel that. Uh, Hugh Walpole had just sent him, uh, and that uh, novel was called um, what Matter, Matter Dick at 40. Uh, and they were close, uh, you know, James and, and Walpole. They, uh, they were 40, there was 40 years of difference in their ages, but uh, you know, uh, James had taken him under his wing and was quite candid with him regarding uh, what he saw as his um, shortcomings <laughs> as, a, as a writer. And in this particular letter, he took issue with this, with this, uh, with some aspect of the book Matter Dick at 40. And he, um, he, he quarrels with the reliance on dialogue as the primary means of access to his character's interiority, arguing that the clarity of contour or what he calls line is thereby replaced by a kind of imprecision or what he calls in a beautiful phrase of vast feather beddiness. And uh, in my research uh, for the introduction, I, I came to you know, discover that this word fe feather beddiness, which I thought was so uh, Richard, uh, turns out to have been quoted from, from the um, letter by a letter from James. And I found that Richard's work has always been, and I should have known this, quite citational and quite uh, dazzling in the way he stitches together uh, patchwork, patchworks together uh, elements of um, texts uh, from outside. I mean, clearly I, he's such an intertextual kind of person. So it's no big surprise that this has been happening all along in the poems. Uh, as many of you know, the uh, again, the, the movie uh, Now Voyager ends with the Betty Davis character saying that immortal line, don't let's, don't let's ask for the moon, we have the stars, uh, which is a nice line, a bit corny, but Richard in this poem uh, does a little bit of a revamping to it, which I find really delightful. But here's the book, Talking Cures, in which it uh, originally appeared, and I'll be reading, reading from that book. Uh, and here it goes. Pardon me as I find it. Now Voyager. It starts uh, with a little epigraph that sort of places the poem. Henry James in 1885, the same year he publishes serially The Bostonians. Poor old Boston, better still or worse, poor back bay, inevitably synonymous with every cramp and curb and suffocating check the flesh is heir to. Heiress in this instance, Charlotte Vale, indentured to a Gorgon Ma, and doomed to be undone by lonely lovelessness. Happily, here, the Gorgon turns to stone, her ugly duckling being metamorphosed, medical magic and the mystic manipulations of modiste and parlor maid to a wandering wanton of the Caribbean, returning as a swan and odorous with erotic reminiscence to take up charitable works in cheerless Boston, for which she has no likely capacity. The thing is dim to me, Charlotte and her married lover, what they did and what they should not have done. Chiefly, there glows for me the figure of 
a changed woman who understands when she is spoken to, a peculiarity I prize as I find it more and more rare. For the rest, on the mild midnight of our actual screen, I see a phosphorescence, not a flame, mostly abuse of voluminous dialogue, absence of all the other phases of presentation, so that line and point are replaced by a vast formless feather beddiness, billows in which one sinks and is lost, and all so unrewarding. It takes us our whole life to learn how to live at all, and having learned, we die. I make out Charlotte is flexible, as Walt enjoins, with all his enviable talent for simplifying. Be it so. Even if, my dear, we don't reach the sun, we shall at least have been up in a balloon. And I just want to say, too, I think that those of us who know Richard uh, well, probably here in that line, it takes us our whole life to learn how to live at all. And having learned, we die. Something so distinctively Richard. I mean, that's an aphoristic note that he hits, you know, throughout his work. And I love it so much. It's so rare these days. And he's such a master of it. It's funny that the, uh, the poem was a wonderful poem and, and uh, uh, that it, it quotes James's uh, deprecation, a Jamesian word, of voluminous dialogue when, um, of course, one of the wonderful things about Richard's poems is his ability to do dialogue yeah. and yes. to use it and, and uh, um, to in some sense, um, well, there's the, there's the kind of negative capability that, that is involved and also the, uh, um, uh, the persona and so on that, that he manages to, to, to avoid the, anyway, um, you had picked that poem probably because, I mean, one of the things we should say is that much of the poems, many of the poems in this book are long. Right. Um, and so difficult. We, we discussed at one point reading one long one in various, doing the voice, the police in different voices as it were, but um, uh, in various, together, but it makes sense to, but, um, the other thing that's interesting there is that that's very much a poem about James as critic. And James was, of course, very self-consciously not only a novelist, but a critic, which is also true of Richard. Is that, um, do, do, um, anyway, that, that very, I mean, it, it's interesting. I think that that variability of, of Richard, both as reader and as writer, is 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 present throughout the book. And it's and you talk about in uh, in your introduction about his speculations on other writers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. You know, and um, I I don't want to uh, preempt other things that people might say, but I remember too when I first experienced Richard is when he was hired to teach at the School of the Arts uh, at Columbia. And a number of us, although we were done with our coursework, we sat in on the lectures that he would give. And uh, there was such, uh, uh, he spoke like no one I had ever encountered. And he could speak extemporaneously in a way that was so gorgeous and so beautifully constructed. There was a sense that he had these sort of and I don't want to say like schemes, but sort of like these sort of sentence structures already within him, you know, not to make it seem as though there was any ossification or rigidity there, very flexible, but he was able to do, he had such choreography in him, you know, and I think that's one of the, one of the, and there's such a sense of preparedness and such an acrobatic training that his mind had with, with regards to the formation of sentences that there would be within these complicated sentences, such as we find in this poem, still moments of real like sort of po almost like poll quotes you know like that that quote that i read about uh it takes us our whole lives to prepare to figure out how to live it all and then we uh then we die um so i think that um th as far as his being a critic goes i think that maybe being exposed to him speaking seeing that he had certain tenets that would recur or certain kinds of uh uh touchstones that he had with regards to sort of what he's considered to be uh um, objectives we might share as poets or goals we might be, uh, we might all somewhat, you know, orient ourselves towards uh, was uh, kind of a, a remarkable thing and it's sort of a, uh, 
an epiphany for me, you know, and it began my own sort of collection of particular ideas that I would cling to as being central to my own uh, sensibility, which is such a Richard Howard word with regards to what we might be, um, what we might hope to do as poets, what we might ex come to expect from poetry. So I think that that's my understanding of his critical work in a sort of, in, in a living kind of way. All right, Rosanna, what, uh, um, why don't we turn to you? You have, uh, I think, Walpole, I think, is, yes. is in, in yours, right? Yes, Walpole comes up again here. This is a longer poem, and I'm only reading a little bit of it, just the beginning. I urge everyone to finish the poem. It's called Notes of an Industrious Apprentice, or What the Master Knew. And it involves uh, uh, Walpole confessing to his diary his experience with Edith Wharton, confessing her disappointment, uh, Richard's word for her, at not having been able to snag a Nobel Prize for Henry James. The, the poem turns into a whole uh, drama after the scene I'm reading, but the, the, the immediate scene I'm reading, um, it seems to me encapsulates in ways that Timothy has already described in his poem, uh, some epigrammatic essence that's as much Richard as it is James. Notes of an Industrious Apprentice, or What the Master Knew, from the London Diary of Hugh Walpole, April 1911, Thursday evening. My first impression, the poor aftermath of a bewildering minute, was that our hostess, I had never been her guest before this afternoon, was overdressed for the occasion, by the time I left, I realized it was the rest of us who had failed to dress appropriately. I've called you here in order to confess our utter failure, how unfortunate yet unavoidable that I must be obliged to bring this sorry news to valued friends who have so long and loyally sustained my little scheme to secure for Mr. James the proper honor of a Nobel Prize. These words were spoken not an hour ago, so all the valued friends might realize how disappointed Mrs. Wharton was by our utter failure to consummate her little scheme, as she was pleased to call the tangled web of testimonials ranging from Sir Edmund Goss, who else so likely to switch on the Northern Lights, to <laughs> dull Dean Howells, the one safe American luminary most of us, Mrs. Wharton summed up her countrymen, so unrestrained, so dubious, so odd. And from her quite nonplussed ambassador in Stockholm to our man in Downing Street, perhaps not her man at all, considering the tact needful to pocket a prix Nobel. If most MPs tell their wives secrets of state, Asquith tells them to other people's wives, Yet even here, Mrs. Wharton had devised an antidote to any subterfuge that might be taken as louche or untoward. Such a cunning letter Paul Bourget wrote for us to the committee it gave those people who knows who they are, Swedes, of course, but how do such Swedes read? Precisely the right pan-European touch to win the only homage worthy of the only master, our own Henry James. Yet now she stood before us, gravely gowned, announcing to our mutual dismay that all these infallible tools had utterly failed. And all we could do, apparently, was drink a little more of her very good champagne, as she described in tortuous detail the shameful rationale of our defeat. The Horton spies had reported that it was problems with English, the English of Henry James, <laughs> which led the Swedes to groom a candidate whose artless French enjoys a flashy vogue, our hostess warming to her poignant theme, in theaters from Paris to Petersburg at all points west a so-called symboliste, whose oiseau bleu, sufficiently inane for a Christmas panto, opens this very week in the West End. Ah, no more, the wretched choice is made and must not be divulged until the Academy is ready to announce its honors in other fields. My sorry news is that Henry James has been passed over for the 1911 Nobel Prize in Literature in favor of a writer known in Belgium as 
the Belgian Shakespeare, Maurice Metterlinck. Tableau, conceive our hostess half in tears and half in high contempt, suggestive of Satan amidst his downcast followers, many wondering who the bugger was. I knew, of course, why didn't she about the master's fond allusion to Metterlinck? Herewith chapter and verse from Wings of the Dove, such the twilight that gathers about them now, like some dim scene in a Metterlinck play, we have the image in the delicate dusk of personages coalesced yet so opposed. It's the moment Milly sees through Kate at last. The angular pale princess, ostrich plumed, black robed and hung about with amulets, quite still against the slowly circling lady of her court who must exchange with her across black water streaked with evening gleams, fitful questions and answers. What a gaff, an insult, really, to take no notice of the master's wonderful citation. How could a serious devotee have missed, oh, not the point, she never misses points, angles, anything acute, but a mirage of life with all the blur of being on it, Mr. James had seen it distinctly enough to take the Metterlinck shadows for his own, a vision that he sanctioned, savored, shared. I wonder, would the master really care all that much about missing a Nobel Prize if he happened to learn that he had just missed it? In Henry James, people are always missing things. And it seems that what it is they miss, they have. Um, I love this poem. And it, so much of, of Richard is condensed and concentrated and crystallized in it. Something that Timothy's already mentioned is how, as you called it, Timothy citational Richard is. He's really a ventriloquist uh, and a polyventriloquist. So many different voices coming together in a texture. I also, I, I have known Richard for 45 years, um, and I was never formally a student of his, but I, I, I hung out and hung around. <laughs> he endured me. Uh, he's been a master for me for 45 years, I would say. And one thing I, uh, I, I, I from the very beginning, uh, wanted to learn from him was how he was splicing prose into verse. So many different kinds of verse that Richard has written and writes, some of them syllabic, some uh, so, some accentual syllabic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's a kind of prose toughness that, that comes through the very ornate metrical um, Baroque of, of, his, of his creations. This happens, uh, here in the moment where the Walpole voice breaks into the Edith War, well, the, the, the Richard's impersonation of, of James's Wings of the Dove, when the Walpole voice suddenly tells us, it's the moment Millie sees through Kate at last. That's so fantastic, the way he breaks the fabric of his own rhetoric for a moment there. And that act of seeing through is so fundamentally James. I think of what Maisie knew, the verbs of vision and the verbs of knowledge are, are deep, deep through James, but they're deep through Richard as well. Um, the moment of breaking through and how the poems, Richard's poems, make those breakthroughs happen by tearing some linguistic and psychological uh, text uh, fabric. Um, uh, and I can't resist a, a line that occurs later in this long poem Nothing is ever lost on Henry James, which seems to me absolutely true of Richard. And I'll conclude these remarks just by saying that two poems of Richard's from that are not in this book, but I've loved for many, many years. One is from a very early book of his, The Damages from uh, 1967. It's the poem Bonheur, a novel where meditating on a Bonheur painting and inventing a whole drama for it such is the prose that wears the poem's guise at last, which where you can hear Richard meditating on his own method. Um, and in another poem from the book Misgivings that I've also loved for many years, and it seems to me to also to be a, a real ars poetica for Richard himself, 
It's the poem Tebais about a painting by Starnina, a late medieval painting. Look, a man may vanish as God vanished by filling all things with created life. And I, I feel that about this, this book, uh, Edwin, that you've edited and that you've introduced, Timothy, that it is somehow feeling all, all things with created life. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's such a, if, if um, you know, Timothy's poem sort of had, had the, the artist as critic, which is certainly, so this poem is one which Richard, this poem, which is a comedy of errors and embarrassments, but also, um, and I don't think we'll ruin the poem to say that what happens that is Henry James has to have, is that Hugh Walpole has to take, escort Henry James to a dinner with Boris Metterlich. Right. So after this, and and in the meantime, so he has to preside over, um, and he's not, of course, he's not to mention to anybody that Henry James hasn't gotten the Nobel Prize. And for that matter, Metterlink doesn't know that he's gotten the Nobel Prize. Right. Right. Uh, and then there's a, there's a, a pickup going on. It's, it's, it's a tremendously novelistic poem. And one of yeah. the wonder, I mean, the Richard's love of, of, um, novelistic coincidence, but coincidence as, as, as something um, as truly telling as, for example, in the poem about Stevens, which I don't think anybody's reading from, which has Stevens going to Paris and a young American poet named Richard meeting Stevens and readers of Stevens know that Richard, that Stevens never went to Paris, even though there's all sorts of French things. So it's a, a hinges on, um, so there are two characters in the poem. One is uh, the Richard character, and the other is a um, a young and very effete young man who's very, very keen on on nobility and aristocracy, and has managed to engineer an invitation to a dinner with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And the poem hinges in part on it's also a very beautiful poem, but this comic poem is this one is on. Wallace Stevens being in the Tour d'Argent, the fancy three-star restaurant of the day, and somebody saying Wallace to Mrs. Simpson. Yeah. And Wallace <laughs> Stevens leaping up in horror, uh, <laughs> thinking that he's being addressed, but and and the effete young man thinking, who's that hopelessly uh, lumpy character over there? Um, so anyway, these kind of wonderful coincidences. But he's he, he, the, the ability that Richard has to bring novelistic things into yeah. the poem is, is also, I think, quite wonderful and quite unusual. Yes, yes. I, I um, loved it when you cited that line, Rosanna, of, uh, of, of an example of Richard's prose register, because it does happen that he'll throw in something that really does feel like prose. But even the moment Millie sees through Kate at last, even though that serves a kind of prose function, it's perfect iambic pentameter, too. Yes. You know, that, exactly. You know, so yeah. Richard, he had those cadences yes. you know, built yes. in. Yeah. I once asked Richard too if that had happened with uh, Wallace Stevens, if that really, and he uh -huh. looked at me like I had just, you know, done a very foolish thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But he said, no, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, the, the acrobatics required, uh, the acrobatics uh, that that Richard performs and his language performs, but he also requires us as readers to perform imaginative acrobatics, wild anachronisms. Yeah. Uh, your question: What was Wallace Stevens embarrassed? I mean, the, the uh, yeah. we are being somehow introduced to such a such a theater of illusion that you fall into the illusion. You sort of believe it, and then you then you have to leap back. That's right. That's right. There's Beautiful. there's in the um in one of the Whitman poems, which has Oscar Wilde visiting Whitman, there is, and I don't know, uh, Wilde comes bent on reading his translation of one of Baudelaire's spleen poems to, and, uh, to Whitman. Whitman is of course off put, you know, Whitman, the author of Leaves of Grass, thinks flowers of evil is a questionable proposition. <laughs> um, but then there is a trend that the translation is totally believable as, as what Wilde might have translated. Um, and, and I don't know whether it is or is not a, a Richard's invention or whether it is a Wildean uh, thing. I suspect it's probably Richard's, Richard, a great translator in his own right, as well as a critic. Oh, yeah, it's, it's made up. He made, made it up? up? Made it up, yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyway, so what were you going to read, Ed? That was the... Uh, 
I'm going to read something from the last poem in the book, Decades, about Hart Crane. Um, before I do, I want to say a little something about, I think, the project here and the way that I think Richard is a bit helpless before his lived erudition and encyclopedic learning, and that he is nailing his colors to the past and intervening um, in the past and inventing things. But there's also a kind of historical backdrop here. And I was looking at one of Richard's essays and this, this line, which I brought to you, was very telling to me because I think it's very revealing about this book. He says, the poem of historical memory and of the placed person always contains the poet's need for secrecy. Mm. This is very striking to me because there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of extravagant dancing and there's a lot of very entertaining uh, incidents here. But there is so a sort of helpless trust in what happened and what came before. And there's also a kind of pain of the artist and extremity of crisis and of the person behind it. That's why I think it was very inspired, Edwin, of you and David Alexander and Richard to put the poem about Hart Crane at the end. I feel almost as if you've ever heard that phonograph, record, phonograph recording of Robert Browning in his own voice. Go, oh, Richard speaks in his own voice. Richard speaks in his own voice. And in this poem, he decades. It's dedicated to Hart Crane, and he trend he he highlights in five sections times when he was four years old, when he was 14 years old, when he was 24, when he was 34, and finally when he was 44. That's the section I'm going to read, which came out in his book, Fellow Feelings. Um, but in, in every stage, when he was four, goes to the first time he goes to a restaurant with his parents, this is the year that Hart Crane died, you feel the sense of the opposition of the father on the other side. The time that he goes at 14, he goes to Lufkoff's bookstore, and that's where the German owner shows him the, the book. He finds the book, The Bridge, and is, he says, will I understand it? And the bookstore owner says, oh, no, you won't understand it, but your, brother, your mother will buy you another book anyway later, so go ahead and get it. Um, the third section is the one I want to mention and read something from before I read the final thing. The fourth section is he goes to a gay bar under Brooklyn Bridge and thinks about Hart Crane. Um, Richard sometimes can't help his jokes. So he and he and Hart Crane both come from Cleveland. He calls them his their mother in lieu. <laughs> but the moment I want to point to here is a moment where Richard does not name the person that he's talking about, but it's Alan Tate. And he's at a, at a restaurant in Paris with Alan Tate. And you know that it's Alan Tate because the person was friends with Hart Crane and wrote a novel called Fathers, which is alluded to here. And um, there's something here that I, I wanna highlight about what it means to be an extremely extravagant unbelievably smart gay kid from Cleveland, Ohio, and a middle-class suburb. And here he's in now in Montparnasse, and he's 24, and he meets Alan Tate, who he admires. And he's thinking about Hart Crane and Alan Tw Tate in the 20s, and then he goes, gay it is, though, and so am I, to his disparagement expressed, dear Hart, in terms of our decadence, as the flaming creatures pass. Such men, he says, fare best as we Southerners say of foxes when most opposed, none so spirited by their own. And yet I see how proud these sick cubs grow. There is a silence, colder than the zinc between us, hopeless. I have lost heart as I always do when I rejoin the fathers, lost the pride of my proclivity and the penalty and disgrace of losing is to become part of your enemy. Have I lost you heart? I need you here quarrelsome drunk on your permanent shore leave from the opposite sex, opposing shore, the loss, the losses, the gain. Mm. 
Now, this is tremendously poignant to me because I think this is what's behind all of this. He calls on Hart Crane because he needs Hart Crane, because he needs the model of Hart Crane to help him get through and navigate the experience of being 24 in Paris, being faced with one of the disapproving fathers. And I think that all of these poems have a secret behind them or secrecy. And the secret is that there's something desperate in this. There's something needed. That's why I'm calling it helpless that Richard calls upon to give this kind of what looks like an intellectual pursuit and is also a kind of emotional urgency. And I think you can see it here in this section called Garrettsville, which is the last section. And um, now Richard is visit, Hart Crane was actually born 35 miles away from Cleveland and Garrettsville and was raised in, in, um, in Cleveland. And Richard is going to Hart Crane's house where he was born um, and his somewhat miserable childhood. And, uh, and, and thinking about it. And he refers to each of the experiences he had in the restaurant and in the bookstore and in the Paris place, et cetera. Garrettsville. By 44, I know you're beginning, lost at land, your end at sea. Sometimes beginnings can be more desperate than ends, patrimony more than matrimony. And middle age, the worst despair of all. I do not find you here or in the bars or loft cuffs or that yellow restaurant, not even on the beach you walked with Walt hand in hand, you told him never to let go. But that is always where you find me. Take my hand as you gave yours to him. We suffer from the same fabled disease and only the hope of dying of it keeps a man alive, keeps. I press your poems as if they were wild flowers for a sidelong grammar of fraternity. We join the fathers after all heart. We join not to repel or repeal or destroy, but to fuse, as Walt declared it. Wisdom of the shores, easy to conceive of, hard to come by, to choose our fathers and to make our history. What takes us has us. That is what I know. We lose being born, all we lose by dying, all. I have seen the birthplace. A strange door closes on a stranger and I walk away. Soon the shadows will come out of their corners and spin a slow web across the wallpaper. Here is where you met the enemy and were theirs. Heart, the world you drowned for is your wife. A farewell to mortality, not my life. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right, Eddie, about the urgency, the poignancy, the pain, and the secrecy. And the secrecy is also um, essential to Henry James, to all of James's fictions and to his prose style, which requires us to uh, become almost um, uh, clairvoyant or to, to, to cultivate a, a commerce with, with spirits and to see through the obvious, to understand what's going on in a Henry James plot. And I, I think that that's partly why this, this collection, R.H. Hart, H.J. and other American writers, uh, why, why James figures so importantly in Richard's imagination all, all through his writing life. Uh, Whitman occupies, I think, the same, same position for, for Richard and, and for the reasons you so beautifully point out. Um, secrecy and revelation going hand in hand. And then what kind of poetics do they, do they engender in, in prose and poetry? Imagine being a young yes. Richard Howard and making yourself up and realizing there was someone named Henry James. Yeah. And, and what that would have meant if you found out that there was someone named J Henry James who thought like that and wrote in that way uh, and, and, and was such a sort of um, writer of consciousness and, 
extraordinary deferrals as you're referring to. And so I think this is part of the calling on, calling on Jane. Yeah. And then I think the Whitman part is the, is the most operatic Whitman. Mm -hmm. The Whitman that loved opera. That, that, that really the Whitman, not of plain speech, but of the, but of the litany of the, of the King James Bible. But also Whitman, the lover. The Whitman, the, the lover, uh, but also the, the, the masked lover, the, the, lo the, the, the lover in very complicated and inexplicit ways. And it that's the Whitman that heart, that's the, yeah. Whitman, I mean, as in that last poem, I mean, again, it was an accident of the way we put it together, which seemed right, but which was a, that we begin with a poem called Life Class. We end with the questions of life and death. I mean, these poems are elaborate and, and ingenious, and, and, but questions of life and death are present throughout. And in a curious way, I think it's Whitman who is the arbiter of them in a way, the, the, um, the Charon almost in a way, or <laughs> both of them. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, that it, Whitman comes up in the Hart Crane, of course, an allusion to a Hart Crane poem, but, but again and again uh, in these different poems, Whitman, James will say, as Whitman says, and so on. Yeah. It's, it's, um, he's less present as a character, but he, he is somehow, well. Uh, but as an American poet, you have to make yourself up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you have to sort of make up a tradition for yourself. And I think that um, that's what Richard is doing here. He, He's inventing a legacy for himself. He's creating a line for himself that goes through Hart Crane and Wallace Stevens back to Whitman and that takes on Henry James and Edith Wharton. And he's, he's making up a tradition for himself to live in. He's placing himself within a, in a way that makes it imaginable to be this sort of person in, I mean, look, we live in one of the most anti-intellectual countries in the world. <laughs> and we're talking about one of the most extraordinary intellectuals that any of us have ever met. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you manage to be like that? Um, to care about books in the way that Richard Howard cares about books? Um, I want to say that he cares intensely, passionately about books, but also about life. Because I think a danger in reading Richard would be to think it's only literary. Yeah, and it is very literary and artistic and aesthetic. But at the core is something about bloodletting, something savage, as I think is going on in James too. And in not so much, I don't think Whitman is savage in that way. Uh, Crane is, in his own way, has that sacrificial intensity. You and I agree about this. I, I think that Richard is a little misunderstood this way. It, it's easy. It's easy to misunderstand because the literary illusions are so tremendous and they're they're so pleasurable. But you can get lost in them. And many people who've imitated Richard imitate the sort of gestures of dramatic monologues of people from the past. But I think what we're feeling is the urgency behind it, and that the thing that's at stake has to do with lived experience and thinking through lived experience. So when Richard puts Wallace Stevens in Paris, it's a kind of joke because Wallace Stevens never got to know, never got to go to Paris. But it's also an imagination about what happens when the provincial American romantic finally gets to be bedazzled by the city of light and, and, what, and, and, and what that means. And so Richard Howard, through his own lens, is, is you know, re-experiencing what it meant for him to go. Um, and, and find that find that other world. So I, I think that the focus on the lived experience and the life lessons is really helpful in this in this book to see a kind of arc through through Richard's work. Well, and the Stevens poem is a poem about revelation, but also deep loneliness, the loneliness of the artist, and and yes. the book is also a reflection on, as you say what is the role of an American artist, which is homesickness and trying to escape, but also trying to, I mean, uh, it comes up again and again. I mean, he's, this is erecting with. That's with what I, th I think you're on to it. I think that's what this book is about. I, I think that, you know, Richard, told, you know, named his extraordinary book of essays about American poetry alone with America. 
And, and I think that at the core of all these poems, as entertaining as they are, there's a kind of loneliness in them. And I think that loneliness is the secret that's driving these, you know, intense imaginative fictions. And I think the way you've structured the book um, highlights that. Well, I think we can turn, we probably have some questions. I think we do. And so we can turn to uh, Hal again uh, and summon him up. Um, I'm back and we do have great questions. Uh, I'm just gonna start at the top. Richard's lines have such beautiful pacing and rhythm and especially pronounced senses of stress as your readings have all shown. Uh, can you speak to his ear and his sense of movement and tension in these longer poems? Hmm. Well, I, I, I don't want to just repeat myself or say what's obvious, um, but one of the glories of these poems is the threading of a natural, the illusion of a natural if ornate speaking voice, something potentially prosaic with a, uh, with a um, brilliant uh, uh, understructure, a metrical, whether it's syllable counting or whether it's uh, a, a stress, a stress meter. So they're profoundly shaped, but the magic of them is that uh, the cadences are also felt to be spoken. I think that's why Browning is a haunting here. Uh, Browning, if you, I mean, in, in Richard's large oeuvre, there are many Browning, there, Browning appears as a character and Browning's son Penn appears in many characters, not in this book, but in others. Look, yeah, he, Richard probably. likes counting. And I think that what you probably hear is some kind of counterpoint between the sometimes syllabic meters and the elaborate speech. And that's the, 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 the difference between say a Jamesian story um, or a story by James and a poem by Richard Howard is the, is the, is, is the, met, is the metrical rhythm. Mm -hmm. And that James has the consciousness of sentences and paragraphs and for Richard, that's lineation and, and stanzas. So I think there's a kind of the, the balance of the syntax and the phrasing and the movement across the, the pressure of the line and the stanza, I would say. Um, what is Richard's relationship with academia and academics? His work walks so very close to critical and biographical writing, yet also seems to poke fun at the same uh, that it can be very hard to tell. I think that um, Richard, um, to me, he always, I mean, he had a very good education at Columbia, but I think he's a kind of auto, autodidact. And even though he taught later in life and was very at home in the university, I think that what I would like to say about this is that there's nothing academic about Richard's learning. And that this, um, this, this really distinguishes Richard from a lot of my colleagues over the years in English departments. Um, and that's, I think the thing we're focusing on is yes, the erudition is extraordinary. The learning is encyclopedic, um, but it's related to kind of lived experience. It's not some kind of cerebral game or, or, or thing unto itself. That's, do you disagree with this Rosanna? No, I, I don't. But I was thinking, Timothy, because you uh, you worked with Richard in, a, in an academic context, wondering what you would say. Oh, you're, sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, you're muted, Timothy. Yes, sorry, I didn't. I forgot I muted. I've got a lot of noise outside the window. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't necessarily complicate or, or certainly not contradict anything that's been said. Um, but um, I, which is, I guess, an indirect way of saying I agree with it. But um, as far as what the question concerned his relationship to academic writing or academic pursuits in the traditional sense, could you repeat the question again, please? Yeah, sure. Um, here, let me just find it real quick. Um, what is Richard's relationship with academia and academics? His work walks very closely to critical and biographical writing, yet also pokes fun at the same. Okay. Hmm. Well, yes, I think I, I think I would probably. I'm, I'm thinking back to what to what Ed said. I think that Rich, in my my own experience of 
with Richard as a person and of course as a, as a, as a poet and as an instructor and as a colleague at Columbia was that um, maybe some of the, uh, uh, the an, an interest in sort of like a, a footnoting or maybe a critical exactitude or some of the more fussy things we might associate with the kind of academic lifestyle choice uh, isn't so much what I would think Richard is, is, was in it, is in it for, you know? I think there's something for him, it's always seemed to me that, that, that an investment in, uh, in high art, an investment in the, the glory of the English language and what he's able to do with the sentence wasn't necessarily about uh, shoring up uh, intelligence per se for a sake of sort of building up a kind of a, a power there, th there with, but for a, a kind of a sense of exhilaration a sense of pleasure, a sense of uh, elevation. I think that um, I think that his his use of just it, again, I'll go back to this this the, the choreography of his sentences, which was so magnetic to me and to so many of the people who would sit in his classrooms, wrapped listening to him, you know, put these sentences together, not just to dazzle us and to make us feel awe, but I don't know how exactly, but almost as if to say, you too can do this. You too can sort of like bask in, in, in the glory of the English language, of the, the poetic tradition, of um, the English tradition and the French tradition. You can sort of do the magic alchemical thing of translation. You can you know, use poetic form to, to, uh, to transform the base materials of, of banal everyday existence into something that has a, a greater claim on our, our attention or something that might find ways to elevate our own sense of being in the world, our own satisfaction with life. You know, when, when you were saying, Rosanna, that he was full of life and really sort of like life forward, life directed, I'd say that that's always been my experience with Richard and that like for all of the, um, for all of the, all of the, the references that people might miss or for all of the, so, uh, um, the, the celebration of, of art that maybe remains remote for people. I've always felt that for Richard, there was, oh, there was the sense that you too have access to this. And I put this before you knowing that you will you, you may potentially find this of value and, and interesting. It wasn't at all elitist to me. It was always very democratic. And I think that that's really been the, and, and I think I'm echoing in a different way what Edward has said, that that's always been the, the secret to Richard, that for someone whose, whose tastes were so top shelf, there was something very, very uh, democratic and very, very sort of generous and uh, uh, arms open wide about him. You everywhere know, Richard taught, everywhere Richard taught, starting when he started teaching summers at the University of Texas, I taught with him for 15 years at the University of Houston. All the years he was at Columbia, he visited Cincinnati. The first thing he did was begin to give lectures for all the department. And the English department would come together and Richard would give these sort of off-handed lectures to kind of bring everyone together. And, and, and in, the, in a shared pursuit of, of literary ends. And I thought he was always sort of weirdly, had a weird way of bringing people together in, into a kind of community around the shared pursuit of reading literature and the urgency of it. I, I'd like to say too that the the writing is an absolutely personal writing. It's in no way a fussy or specialized writing. It's absolutely personal writing, which is why I think he's also a great teacher. That uh... we did have a couple of questions um, about Richard's translations. Um, one that I do want to pick on: Can we find relationships in these poems to any of his his translations? Any or to all. <laughs> they are all in some sense a kind of translation. I think James it was it said that all kind all writing is translation of one sort or another. So I think that in, in the introduction, Timothy points to the connection to Richard's translations of Siran, yeah, which mm -hmm. is very, I think, very close to home. There's the ludic element in the translations of Roland Bart. I mean, where to start? I mean, I think it's all part of the same. It's it's not. It's all part of the same project. Yeah. I think I think of it as an anti-romantic project, and that it, Richard and his generation. If you think of what it is to be an American poet writing in the 
50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, he's not at all a beat. He's not a quote confessional. He's making a marking out a path for himself, which is entirely distinct. And it has to do in a sense with, uh, yes, invention of a self or plural selves th through, through a complex language, some of it tr translated from other languages, some of it translated from experiences. Um, but, uh, the, the, um, but, but there's a, a, a sense of uh, that he's gone his own way quite extraordinarily if you look at the poets who were writing and publishing um, around him. Uh, and I think translation has to do with that. It's as if he made English almost a foreign language in order to feel it more deeply. And selfhood uh, is foreignness and needs to be refelt, rediscovered uh, in, 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 in a constantly reinvented language. Um, uh, maybe that's one of the reasons I, I love the, the Starnina poem, the Tebai so much, look a man may vanish as God vanished by filling all things with created life. A lot of poets don't want to vanish, but, but in a sense, Richard finds himself by vanishing. Um, and, and I think that's about translation too, taking on other voices or inventing them. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So we'll end with, um, can each of you talk about your first experience reading a Richard Howard poem? That's hmm. hard to remember. <laughs> You're welcome to pass or pick a favorite. No. I, I was just a girl then. I can hardly remember. Oh. <laughs> long ago. Actually, the first thing I read of Richard's was as a teenager was Alone with America. It was not his poetry, but the, the big compendium where he, he uh, wrote about all his contemporary contemporaries and older poets and, and for me, it was um, a, a kind of Baedeker to the world of poetry, uh, mm -hmm. which um, uh, sometimes I disagreed with sometimes. And, and, but of course it was also because Richard's criticism is imbued with his voice as anything else. It was also a, an exposure to uh, Richard's poetry in, in, in a way, because in fact that poetry, I think ex as we've tried to say, uh, expands between both his criticism and his poetry and his and uh, and his translations. They are all part of a of a of a of a single project of a multiple man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it was the first, but very early on, I I um, I mentioned the poem Bonnard, uh, a novel, uh, because I was trying to be a painter in those years. I. I, I I, I was became passionately involved in that poem uh, and in the vision of Bonnard and the vision of life that that Richard dramatized in it. And the the series of poems he wrote about the photographs of Nada, uh, I think that's it. Those are in misgivings, uh, portraits of Victor Hugo and Sarah Bernhardt and Baudelaire and, and so forth. So another aspect of Richard is he translates visual art as he later translated, say, the sculptures of Dorothea Tanning. That's another kind of translation, turning, giving voice to visual art. I mean, extended ecrises. I think the first book of Richard's I read was Damages that Rosanna referred to. I think that's where we're of that age and came up with that. And, and I think the thing that struck me was, I mean, I remember the Bonnard poem, but the thing that struck me about the whole book was that it was unlike all the other books in the Wesleyan poetry series mm -hmm. that, it, that, it, that it came with. And so it struck me that this was another idea of how to become an American poet or what an American poet was, because it was the moment of deep imagism in American poetry. And we were reading James Wright and, um, Robert Bly and W.S. Merwin. And here comes Richard Howard's damages with a Bonard poem and with different voices. And it seemed like something else. And I think it just expanded the horizon, certainly the vocabulary of, um, <laughs> of what, a, what, Amer what American poetry could do. I'll just say, tell you something funny about that. Once Richard was writing a blurb for, for someone and I happened to be around and he had just written, he's the best 
monosyllabic poet we've got going. <laughs> it's not a compliment. I don't think that's a compliment. I don't think, I don't think that. that. Not, not, not for Richard. That's a compliment. The, first, the first time I remember reading or being aware of Richard's work, I think truly, or the was at the uh, the launch reading that he gave for his book, Like Most Revelations, uh, back in 94. It was right after he came back to, to New York to teach at Columbia. And uh, I think it was at Books and Company, you know, when that was around still mm -hmm. in the 90s. And um, I think the poem that made the, the, the greatest impact on me was that title poem, which is at the end of the book. And it's uh, a different kind of poem from the others that we've been talking about mostly. It's not a monologue, it is a, 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 a lyric poem with a good deal of refraining to it, um, a different, more like a incantatory poem. And it, uh, that's, uh, I won't forget that, that feeling. I remember having him sign my book and he signed it, this again, back in the mid nineties, uh, for whom most revelations lie ahead, you know, uh -huh. and, you know <laughs> 25, over 25 years ago, you know, and the bookstore is gone, but we still got uh, Richard and his words, you know, and, uh, and uh, some, a few revelations still ahead of us, I think. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful way to end it. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. Edward, Edwin, Rosanna, Timothy. This was really, really fabulous. Um, for all of you who are Richard Howard readers, we hope that that was some balm for the last week of stress. Uh, if you are not a Richard Howard reader, um, I'm sure you are now a Richard Howard reader. Uh, and otherwise, we wanna thank NYRB Classics for joining us you know, tonight to put on this program. Um, as mentioned, we have a lot more programming with them coming up uh, this November. So please check out our website to find out more. Um, and otherwise, I just want to wish everyone well, be safe, be healthy, um, and keep reading Richard Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.